Okay, so hello again. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is our Jacqueline Kennedy week of history live stream programs that we're doing uh, the next several days. We're doing it because it's the 60th anniversary of Jacqueline Kennedy's famous White House tour, which took place on February 14th, 1962. And in honor of that, we've had a whole series of programs scheduled um, during the month of February. Today's program is Jacqueline Kennedy cooking with the First Ladies with our friend Sarah Morgan, joining us live from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so welcome, Sarah. I'm going to turn things over to her in just a second. But before we do, my name is Robert Kellerman. I will be your co-host, kind of more of the MC today <laughs> than the host. Um, and we're joined by Sarah Morgan. And she started this really cool initiative called Cooking with the First Ladies. And I first met Sarah about a year ago. She did a program on Grace Coolidge. And a funny thing happened. I signed up for it. I was really looking forward to it. And this particular day, about a year ago, I felt really sick. I just was not feeling good at all. And I was tempted to not join the program. But the last minute I said, you know what, I'll just call in for a few minutes um, and see what this is all about. And so I did, and I was so glad I did because Kara did an amazing job of walking us through the history of First Lady Grace Coolidge. And these are just a couple of photos from Sarah from her previous programs. Um, she has an Instagram page that you should check out if you're on Instagram. It's called Cooking with the First Ladies. So Cooking with the First Ladies is run by Sarah Morgan. And she's done two other previous programs with us that are on our YouTube channel. So if you didn't get a chance to watch those before, um, you can check those. I'll post the link for those in the chat in Zoom in just a minute. Uh, the first one that she did was a repeat of her Grace Coolidge Cooking with the First Ladies program. And then the second one she did was Rosalind Carter. And so if you want to learn more about Grace Coolidge and Rosalind Carter, two fascinating first ladies, you should check that out. But today she's going to be talking about Jacqueline Kennedy. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah. And Sarah, it's all yours. Awesome. Well, again, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan, again, with Cooking with First Ladies. And I'm so excited to do another one of these live programs for DC Culture. Uh, again, for the 60th anniversary of Jackie's White House tour uh, back in February of 1962. I have my copy out of Jackie's White House tour today for the program. Uh, but, you know, uh, Jackie has been one of the most endeared first ladies a personal favorite of mine. I know a lot of, you know, other people, of course, but she just had this impeccable fashion sense, uh, just this love of history, uh, perseverance, and her devotion as a mother, especially uh, for us as Americans. Uh, but she was also as CNN's First Ladies uh, program, which if you're into the First Ladies, it's a great program to watch. Uh, she was described as glamour on the outside, but heartache on the inside. Uh, she was also known and equally as important at, for her highly publicized, you know, restoration of the White House and her emphasis on arts and culture. Uh, Jackie, you know, of course, not only became a global fashion icon, but a symbol of strength. Uh, so tonight, or this evening, uh, or this afternoon, uh, we uh, will be making a Boston cream pie, which actually became the Massachusetts official state dessert back in 1996, um, a spinach risotto, as well as a Jackie O inspired baked potato and a crudite platter. Um, inspired by Renee Burden, who was the French chef hired by Jackie. Uh, however, we're going to start with a couple of cocktails. Uh, Jackie actually elevated the role of the cocktail because it said she kind of scandalized Washington society uh, by introducing pre-dinner cocktails rather than the traditional punch. Um, although the press kind of complained, but everything with Jackie was a bit too French. Uh, everyone adapted really pretty quickly to the entire tradition. 
Uh, so essentially, she didn't leave her mark just on fashion, but also the popularity of the cocktail. Uh, so our first this evening is the Clint. Uh, now, this particular cocktail we're going to make first was inspired by her Secret Service agent, Clint Hill, uh, who is an American hero after he jumped onto the back of the car during the horrible assassination of JFK in order to protect the first lady. And it was essentially known as the Clint. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take some ice and we are going to take um, two shots of Campari. And again, this is a Negroni, but with a twist. Jackie inspired. Um, and you're gonna take a shot of vodka. And then what you're going to do is squeeze in a little bit of orange. And then uh, your soda water. Once you've done that, make sure it's all a little bit mixed up. Pour it into your glass and garnish with an orange slice, which I got an exceptionally large orange at the store, obviously. But uh, cheers to Clint Hill, who literally American hero um, on that fateful day. Okay, so our next cocktail we're gonna make is the Femme Fatale. And this particular cocktail uh, is inspired uh, by the Hotel Le Royale uh, Elephant Bar in Cambodia, where uh, Jackie had went and stayed during a trip in 1967. Uh, they supposedly still have the glass that has her lipstick imprint um, from when she drank this particular champagne based cocktail. Um, Jackie also supposedly drank about one glass of champagne every single day. So uh, to make this, you're gonna take strawberry liqueur. And um, I make my own strawberry liqueur. It's very easy. You just puree your strawberries, add a little bit of your choice of vodka, um, and then let that sit. You can also add a little bit of sugar, um, depending on how sweet you like your liqueur. So add just a little bit of strawberry liqueur, just a little bit of cognac, and then finally top it off with your champagne. almost overflowed, but we're good. Uh, and then um, I like to garnish it not only with a rose as they did uh, for her particular Femme Fatale cocktail, but also a strawberry. So um, there you have it, a Clint. Oh, very awesome so far, very good. Fatale. Okay, so um, I'm going to pop over to my computer and share my screen for just a moment and share just a short PowerPoint um, to share a little bit of information about Jackie Kennedy. And then we'll come back and cook a little bit. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. If you're watching live on Zoom, I posted the links for Sarah's other two programs in the Zoom chat and also the link for her Instagram page. We, um, we didn't send the recipes just yet for tonight's program, but we'll do that tomorrow. So if you were looking for those, we'll email those out to you um, tomorrow. Okay. So Jackie was a first lady in a traditional and turbulent time where sex, love, and rock and roll was the theme, but not only were there protests and social unrest in the streets, 
but a convergence between the classy 1950s style and expectations and the hippy dippy 1960s. The Queen of Camelot in the 60s was one of the most well known public figures in the world. And although she was young, like most of the generation at the time, she held on to the sophisticated views of earlier decades. The 60s, often referred to as the age of renewal, actually were one of the younger generations with over 50% being under 18 and most being very affluent. The 1960s were not just groovy, they literally had some of the most extremely iconic moments in modern history from hippies to the Vietnam War, and as the birds would say, every season turn, turn, turns. Elsewhere in the world, construction on the Berlin Wall began in 1961. These moments from revolutions beginning to astounding achievements made the decade one of the most memorable and iconic, as well as tumultuous decades in modern history due to anti-war protests, the civil rights movement, and the assassination of two public figures, MLK and JFK. The civil rights movement was at its height. And even though some progress was made with the passing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which of course made it illegal to discriminate based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, there were still many setbacks. One, you know, one of the most famous moments of the decade was Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. There was, of course, as well, the Cuban Missile Crisis, during which Jackie refused to leave the White House to relocate during uh, that time to a safe shelter. By far, the most historic event uh, occurred on July 20th, 1969, when the United States went to space. And Neil Armstrong historically was the first to step foot on the moon and said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. However, another significant scientific advancement was in 1967, when the first heart transplant was completed, which both have been described as totally out of sight. The 60s were a fashionable time. 1963 saw the feminine mystique and the women's liberation movement, which led to the 1965 introduction of the miniskirt. Uh, and Jackie has always remained the most classic style icon. Although the elegance of the 1950s carried over to the 1960s, style especially inspired by popular model Twiggy, which included fake eyelashes. And it took precedence among some with their threads, including ponchos, love beads, polka dot prints, bell button, bell button jeans, excuse me, go-go boots, psychedelic prints, and hairstyles, including excessive use of hairspray. Barbies were all the rage, and she even got a boyfriend, Ken. Afros and bell bottoms were boss and the decade of flower power, lava lamps and trolls were far out as were sea monkeys, easy bake ovens, bean bag chairs and chatty Kathy dolls. The Flintstones made their TV debut. ABC began color telecasts. Pocket sized transistor radios were introduced as well as eight track stereos for cars and portable record players books such as To Kill a Mockingbird, Valley of the Dolls, and A Wrinkle in Time were on the way out as color TV started taking center stage with the first television broadcast in color in 1962. The decade also saw the publication of Julia Child's famous cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and the debut of her popular cooking show, The French Chef. 1962 also saw the invention of the very first computer game, Space Wars. From everybody doing the twist by Chubby Checker in 1960 to the introduction of Motown. And then on February 9th, 
1964, the Beatles first performed before a US audience of 75 million viewers, which was over half of the American audience at that time on the Ed Sullivan Show, making the British invasion official. Sadly, however, the 1960s not only saw so many deaths of those fighting for our country, or even those innocent people in Vietnam who couldn't help the struggle they were caught in. The 1960s also saw Patsy Cline die in a tragic plane crash, as well as Truman Capote's coverage of the murders of the Clutter family in the book In Cold Blood, and of course, the horrific Helter Skelter of Manson. 1962 saw yet another tragedy when Marilyn Monroe passed away. Of course, Jackie and Marilyn had a relationship of sorts. Uh, the book, In the Few Precious Years, the final year of Jack and Jackie, states that Marilyn once called Jackie and told her that JFK had actually promised to marry her. And Jackie responded by saying, quote, Marilyn, you'll marry Jack, that's great. And you'll move into the White House and you'll assume the responsibilities of the First Lady and I'll move out and you'll have all the problems. Jackie was relatively aware of JFK's affairs, but the potential of one with Marilyn bothered her the most because it could be the one to become very public and cause a scandal. Now, Jacqueline Lee Bouvier was born on July 28th, 1929 in Southampton, New York to Janet, a socialite, Excuse me. Uh, and in fact, she was the first first lady to have been born in a hospital. Jackie grew up in a wealthy and privileged family. She was a skilled equestrian who began riding horses at the age of one. By the time she was 11, she had won several national championships. And in 1940, the New York Times wrote a piece about her accomplishments after she had a double victory, which was rare for young writers in the same show. As a young lady, she took classical ballet lessons and studied French. Although she had a very privileged childhood, she was deeply affected by her parents' divorce in 1940, which included her mother's remarriage, as well as her father's alcoholism, affairs, and financial struggles, which mostly stemmed from issues after the crash of 1929. Now, Jackie attended first grade at Mrs. Chapin's school on East End Avenue in New York. One of her teachers, Miss Platt, thought Jackie was, quote, a darling child, the prettiest little girl, very clever, very artistic, and full of the devil. And a few times, she was even sent to the headmistress, all mostly because she would finish her work quickly get bored, and then act out. She graduated from Miss Porter's school, a boarding school in Connecticut for girls in June 1947. She attended Vassar College uh, in New York in her junior year and spent a year studying abroad in Paris. She said, quote, I loved it more than any year of my life. Being away from home gave me a hunger for knowledge, something I had always tried to hide. And I came home glad to start in here again, but with a love for Europe that I am afraid will never leave me. After returning home, she transferred to George Washington University to be closer to her family. She ultimately graduated with a bachelor's in fine arts and French literature. In 1951, she began her first job for the Washington Times Herald newspaper with the title of the Inquiring Camera Girl. She would wander the city and take pictures of people as well as ask them pressing questions about current issues and events. She not only interviewed Richard Nixon, but also covered the Eisenhower inauguration and Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. And not only had these experiences, but she visited the White House in 1941 as a tourist with her family. Ironically, she turned down an internship at Vogue because the current editor told her it might harm a potential marriage. 
Uh, she met John F. Kennedy in 1952, who was a congressman at the time and was elected Senator of Massachusetts later that same year. At a dinner party in Washington, DC, another person she interviewed. Uh, and after their first meeting, Jack said, quote, I've never met anyone like her. Jack actually proposed to her by hiding a ring inside of a piece of potato at the bottom of a bowl of clam chowder at Martin's Tavern in Boston on July 24th, 1953, which actually has a booth marking the event. However, some say it may have occurred at the Omni Parker. Uh, now, Jackie and John married on September 12, 1953 in Newport, Rhode Island, and she described it as ethereal. Their storybook wedding attended uh, by 800 guests with an additional 400 showing up at their reception. It ultimately took them two hours to greet everyone. Uh, Jackie's wedding dress was actually designed by Ann Lowe who was an up and coming talented African-American dressmaker. The original wedding dress also had another story of its own. It was destroyed after a pipe burst, uh, along with nine of the bridesmaids dresses uh, and the staff worked round the clock in order to remake them. And they basically saved the day. However, sadly, Lowe went uncredited for her work. Uh, up until honestly recently, uh, and for rescuing the Kennedy's wedding day. Uh, they honeymooned for two weeks in Acapulco and spent the next week on the California coast, ending their trip with a stay in the Beverly Hills mansion uh, that was actually where the Godfather trilogy was filmed. Uh, they even received a blessing from the Pope. Uh, one of their courses at the wedding reception was, of course, one of Jackie's favorite foods, fruit salad served in a pineapple. Uh, the Kennedys unfortunately treated her as quote, like Rhode Island, meaning an asset, but Jack had an admiration and overwhelming pride for her. JFK announced his presidency in January of 1960 and the couple immediately began traveling the country campaigning. And during this time, Jackie learned that she was pregnant and after being ordered by her doctor to stay at home, she continued to answer hundreds of letters, taped TV advertisements, gave interviews, and wrote Campaign Wife, a weekly newspaper column. JFK, of course, ultimately beat Nixon to become the 35th president of the United States. And just a little less than three weeks later, Jackie gave birth to their second child, John Jr. They were the only first couple to have a baby between election day and inauguration day. The Kennedys had multiple instances of miscarriage and unfortunately in August of 1963, Jackie gave birth to Patrick, their third child, who unfortunately suffered from issues with his lungs and passed away at the Children's Hospital in Boston. Jackie was only 31 years old when JFK, the youngest person ever elected president, as well as the first Catholic to be elected, was sworn into office on January 20th, 1961, making her the third youngest first lady. On inauguration night, it was snowing and Jack turned the lights on inside the car so people could see Jackie because she was so beautiful. Later, she would say to him, quote, oh, Jack, what a day. However, they actually gave her amphetamine pills so she would attend the inaugural balls due to her fatigue after giving birth so recently. Uh, she also once said, quote, the one thing I do not want to be is called first lady. Sounds like a saddle horse. Would you notify the telephone operators and everyone else that I'm to be known simply as Miss Kennedy and not as first lady. The Kennedys, of course, brought a youthful and fresh spirit to the White House, and they both believed the White House should be a place that celebrated American culture, history, and the country's achievements. However, her main obligation 
uh, was to be a good wife and a great mother saying, quote, if you bungle raising your children, I don't think whatever you do else matters very much. Uh, one of her first priorities was turning the porch into a school for Caroline and other staff members children and also installing a swing set and treehouse on the White House lawn for both of her children. Uh, Jackie's other really main project as First Lady was the restoration and preservation of the White House and her goal was for the public to have a greater appreciation of the history of the residents as well as the former First Ladies and Presidents. This led her to create the first curator position for the White House as well as the White House Fine Arts Committee which collected furniture and artifacts from around the country uh, that belonged to former residents of the home. Uh, Jackie fully restored all the public rooms in the White House and as we're celebrating today, famously presented this achievement on CBS with a tour of the White House with Miss Kennedy on February 14th, 1962. Uh, that drew an audience of 80 million viewers. She was actually nominated and won the Emmy for the program, making her the first first lady to ever win the award. Another of her focuses during her time as Flotus was the arts. She hosted several dinners and events where she invited artists, poets, authors, scientists, and musicians to mingle with the politicians and diplomats. Uh, she also redesigned the First Lady's Garden, which was later named for her. Uh, Jackie updated the Rose Garden and afterwards in 1961 actually had a rose named after her. The Rosa Prima First Lady Rose is described as being the pure embodiment of innocence and elegance with its coloring being reminiscent of ivory antique piano keys. Her favorite flower, however, was not a rose, but white peonies and blue cornflowers. Jackie also traveled the world alongside her husband with trips to Paris, Vienna, Greece, Italy, India, and Pakistan. Her interest in other countries and their culture, along with her ability to speak several foreign languages, including French, Spanish and Italian made her an amazing representative of the United States and she was popular with the foreign diplomats. However, one trip did not go so well. When Jackie and John visited Buckingham Palace in June of 1961, she insulted the queen when a few weeks later, uh, Elizabeth was uh, quoted as being saying uh, she was called a middle-aged woman so incurious, unintelligent, and unremarkable that Britain's new reduced place in the world was not a surprise, but an inevitability. She went on to describe the palace as, quote, a second-rate, dilapidated, and sad, sort of like a neglected provincial hotel. The whole incident actually plays out in The Crown on Netflix. Uh, much as when it's all been slightly proven to have a little truth to it, but nobody can know for sure. What we do know is that whatever Jackie said, she did apologize later. Uh, Queen Elizabeth subsequently opened a memorial in the UK in 1965 near the area where the Magna Carta was signed by King John back in 1215. Uh, for JFK after his assassination, which was attended by Jackie and her children. Um, and currently uh, also established the Kennedy Memorial Trust by the British government and awards scholarships to British postgraduate citizens who choose to attend Harvard or MIT. Uh, now as first lady, Jackie started fashion trends rather than follow them. Jackie became a world-renowned fashion icon as First Lady, and after the election, she commissioned Oleg Cassini, who was a family friend of the Kennedys, to design her own personal wardrobe, and to whom she referred to as 
the Secretary of Style, many of which some of her most iconic looks, which are over 300 ensembles, have been designed by. Uh, this included her inaugural day coat, as well as her dress for the inaugural ball, and many of her outfits she was photographed in on their official international travels. Ultimately, her love of not only French food and culture, but her preference for French designers such as Chanel, Balenciaga, Givenchy, and more became a slight issue with the American people. So she attempted to find American designers to use, one of which was Ben Zuckerman, who created the purple wool coat for Inauguration Day. But she instead wore that to meet Mamie Eisenhower to tour the White House for the first time. Now, during this tour, Jackie had just given birth, basically a few hours earlier to John Jr. She was offered a wheelchair, but declined and walked instead. Although uh, Jackie uh, called Mamie a gracious host, Mamie had also previously referred to Jackie as the college girl because she was kind of ultimately jealous of her youthfulness. And also Mamie sincerely did not want to leave the White House. Now Jackie hand selected every single piece of her wardrobe down to the smallest detail and was very aware of the influence her fashion choices had. During the infamous trip to Dallas, she wrote an itinerary for the trip, which included this detailed list for every single outfit the iconic Jackie look, which featured tailored suits, knee-length skirts, three-quarter sleeves on the jacket, elbow-length gloves, sleeveless A-line uh, dresses, excuse me, low heel pumps and pill pillbox hats, all of which became extremely popular in the United States. Now her signature bouffant hairstyle was also popularized. And more than any other first lady, her style and look was copied by commercial manufacturers and young ladies. One of her signature pieces during that time was her classic triple strand pearl necklace created by American jeweler, Kenneth J. Lane. In addition, a Tiffany & Co. designer created what is known as the berry brooch which is strawberries made of rubies and diamonds, stems and leaves, which was not only personally chosen by JFK, but also given to her by him prior to the inauguration. Uh, another jewelry designer she adored was Schlumberger and she wore his gold and enamel bracelet so much in the 1960s, they became known as Jackie bracelets. The Metropolitan Museum of Art once said, quote, she set the standard for how an entire generation of women wanted to look, dress, and behave. And in 1965, she was named to the International Best Dressed List Hall of Fame. Now, of course, on November 21st, 1963, Jackie and John left, left for their trip to Texas. This was actually one of the first times she had joined him on this type of trip in the United States. On the next day, the 22nd, they had breakfast and then took a short flight from Fort Worth to Dallas's Love Field. Jackie was famously wearing her beautiful pink Chanel suit with a signature pillbox hat, which had actually been personally chosen by President Kennedy. The motorcade, where the governor of Texas, as well as LBJ and Lady Bird followed, was heading to the trademark where the president was to give a speech. As the car drove slowly past cheering crowds, shots rang out when they neared the Texas School Book Depository. Almost immediately after the bullet struck Jack in the head, Jackie began to climb out the back of the limousine. Clint Hill, who, of course, we made the cocktail in honor of. Uh, remembers telling the Warren Commission he had to jump on the back of the car in order to get her back into the seat. And he believes, honestly, she was reaching for a piece of his skull. Although he was rushed to nearby Parkland Hospital, uh, Jackie 
was only at the age of 34 and will never forget the sounds of the gunshots uh, from the car, uh, thinking that they were backfiring, basically. Uh, Jackie continued to wear her infamous bloodstained Chanel suit as she boarded Air Force One to be present as LBJ took the oath of office. Uh, not only uh, did he want her to be pre present to demonstrate his legitimacy as president, president, but also in order to quote, I want them to see what they did to Jack. She even said later that she regretted washing her bloodstained hands and face because of the same reason. She honestly wanted them to see what they had done to him. The suit, unlaundered, was donated to the National Archives and Records Administration in 1964, but per Caroline Kennedy's request, will not be on display until about 100 years from now. The iconic pink suit and pillbox hat has also become a symbol of her husband's assassination and has a kind of a story of its own. Uh, because of her scrutiny over wearing French designers, the Chanel suit was an exact replica made with Chanel fabric sent from Paris to New York, where then it was actually sewn. After the assassination, Jackie became very close with Robert Kennedy, and he was the source of support for her and the children, and she ultimately was very supportive in his campaign for senator. Uh, now, Jackie was very involved in planning the funeral um, and famously walked alongside the proce procession to the actual burial site. Now, a week after the assassination, Jackie was interviewed by Theodore White of Life magazine, where she compared their years in the White House to King Arthur's Camelot because JFK often actually listened to that musical before bed, and she famously said, quote, don't let it be forgot that for once there was a spot, this brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. There will be great presidents again, but there will never be another Camelot. She actually made it a stipulation, basically saying, no Camelot, quote, no swery. Now, also in that next week after the assassination, LBJ issued an executive order establishing the Warren Commission to investigate the event. Uh, Jackie and her children stayed in the White House for two weeks following the assassination. And although LBJ offered her an ambassadorship to France, she declined and many really believed, of course, as anyone would, that she suffered from PTSD uh, following the assassination. Uh, now, eventually, she came back into the public eye when in 1967, during the Vietnam War, she was given the title America's Unofficial Roving Ambassador by Life magazine. Uh, Jackie is also best known for her fashionable and iconic style, as well as the influence she had over the fashion industry. Now in the 1970s, she oversaw, uh, of course, uh, preventing the destruction of historic buildings in Lafayette Square in New York. Um, she also led a campaign to save and restore Grand Central Station. Um, and back in 1968, Jackie had married Aristotle Onassis, of course, the Greek shipping magnate who was over 20 years older than her and one of the wealthiest men in the world. Uh, they were married in a Greek Orthodox ceremony on his private island in Greece. And by taking his last name, not only became Jackie O, but then lost her entitlement uh, of secret service protection. Her wedding dress was Valentino and she was not only a huge fan of his designs, but Valentino credits her for the Valentino boom. Uh, so when she attended the Met Gala in 1979, where of course she had an existing relationship uh, with Valentino, this 
furthered this establishment of his work and various costume exhibits of Jackie's. Uh, the marriage to Onassis not only changed her popularity status with the American public, uh, but they, some people saw it as a betrayal to JFK. Uh, she also kind of changed up her looks. She wore the tailored suits, the large sunglasses, the headscarves by Hermes, and she supposedly slept in uh, silk pajamas and used silk pillows to maintain her blowout hairstyles. Uh, she also started a trend of white jeans and the black turtleneck. Uh, and Jackie spent about $1.25 million, which would be close to 9 million today on her wardrobe during her first year of marriage to Onassis. Now, Jackie was seen as a trophy wife of Aristotle and was so differently portrayed than she was during her time as first lady, leading the press to refer to her as, quote, a spendthrift and reckless woman. After his death, she revived her image. And when she moved back to New York, not only began her publishing career, but also put more of a focus on preserving President Kennedy's legacy, charity work, and her family. Her new career as an editor began at Viking Press in 1975. She later moved to Doubleday as a senior editor and enjoyed her successful publishing career until her death in 1994. Uh, during her career, a few of the notable works she edited included the autobiographies of Carly Simon, as well as Michael Jackson's Moonwalk. This was not her first experience with novels because as a senator, JFK suffered from debilitating back pain due to football injuries and had to have, excuse me, two surgeries. During his recovery, Jackie encouraged him to write Profiles and Courage. Jackie also continued to have a part in politics and attended the Democratic Convention in 1976. She also attended the event at Faneuil Hall in Boston, along with her former mother-in-law, Rose Kennedy, when Ted Kennedy announced his intention to challenge current president at that time, Jimmy Carter. She also supported the Clintons momentarily during his campaign in the 1990s. And by then, after the election, giving Hillary advice in which Hillary said that Jackie was, quote, a source of inspiration and advice for me. Uh, however, one day in 1993, Jackie was horseback riding when she fell from the horse. Subsequently, she was diagnosed with a swollen lymph node in her groin area, which turned out to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which unfortunately spread to her brain, spinal cord, and liver, and then terminal cancer. Although she went uh, underwent chemotherapy, she died in her sleep in her Manhattan apartment on May 19, 1994. Shortly after her death on May 23rd, 1994, Jackie's funeral was held at the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola, where she was baptized and confirmed. Uh, she was buried uh, ultimately alongside President Kennedy and their infant son, Patrick, um, as well as another stillborn child, Arabella. Now, above all else, Jackie sought to preserve and protect America's cultural heritage, and she captivated the nation and the entire world with her intelligence, beauty, and grace. With a deep sense of devotion to her family and country, she dedicated herself to raising her children and to making the world a better place through art, literature, and a respect for history and public service. Uh, she is one of the well, most well-known as well as most beloved First Ladies and in 2011, she was ranked in the top five most influential first ladies of the 20th century. Um, more recently, she was featured on Time Magazine's 100 Women of the Year, and many people still strive to this day to emulate her and her fashion. 
Uh, so, as I'm hoping that y'all are excited, we're going to get ready to cook. Uh, but um, although many politicians have been from Boston, JFK has many bar rooms as well as restaurants named after him, more than any other. Uh, the Kennedy booth at the Union Oyster House where he supposedly ate lobster stew, uh, the Omni Parker Hotel where he supposedly proposed to Jackie, again, uh, in contrast to another place that also wants to claim that. Uh, but, you know, Jackie also uh, followed a very strict diet. These include, excuse me, included uh, very simple dishes from cottage cheese. She would also go on fruit fasts if she was eating too heavy. Uh, and just fruit in general was something she really enjoyed. Uh, Jackie was also a picky eater, but she loved poached chicken and fish, especially salmon. Um, and though she maintained a diet, which we'll talk about more when we start cooking, uh, she did like strawberries Romanoff, and she also would occasionally sneak brownies out of the White House kitchen. Now, another snack she enjoyed was Jiffy Popcorn, which was invented in 1959. And strangely enough, Sam Adams' Boston Lager was originally known as Jackie O. Suds because she enjoyed beer and would hold her pillbox hat over her stomach to hide her beer gut. Totally kidding. However, uh, she did enjoy about a glass of champagne a day. Um, okay, so let's get cooking. I hope y'all have stuck with me. Through my oh yeah, no, thanks, Sarah. It's interesting to learn about the uh, the woman behind the myth, so to speak. Uh, yes. Okay. So have I stopped sharing? Yes. Okay. Yay! All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, first up, we're gonna make our Boston cream pie. And um, not going to full on make the Boston cream pie because, of course, we can't be here all day and all night. Uh, so I pre made a cake and our pastry cream as well as our chocolate. Uh, but I am going to demonstrate making the actual uh, cake batter. Uh, so, what we're going to do, we're going to take our egg whites. You're going to have seven egg whites, seven egg yolks. Um, Sarah, I told people gonna... that we would, um, we can email them the recipes later if they don't want to take notes. Is that correct? 100%. Okay. I yeah. So, the... so you don't have to, you don't have to take notes, everyone. We'll email them to you later. 100%. Um, and also I do always like to say this during any of my live programs that I do rather for this or for the National First Ladies Library, I'm a historian, I'm not a chef. Um, I follow the recipes, um, so don't judge me if things aren't perfectly right. Um, and I love uh, suggestions on cooking, but anyway. I don't think anyone would have ever noticed. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna take uh, our, uh, seven egg whites, half of our sugar. We're gonna mix that. We're gonna put in our seven egg yolks. To, to go back to what you were saying a minute ago, there was probably people out there thinking, wow, she's a chef and a historian. And- but, but I think if you'd never admitted that, no one would ever know. Well, that's nice. Um, and then we're gonna add in our butter and our flour and it's a simple sponge cake mix. I don't like Boston cream pies. They're not actually pies, they're cakes. Um, and, and they can be a little more complicated than what, what it seems. So 
what we've got here is our sponge cake mix. So that's how you do that. And again, uh, that's that's kind of the, well, I won't even take it off. But what I do have and what I've decided to do with this particular live program, since we're celebrating a 60th anniversary situation is we're gonna make a three layer Boston cream pie. Um, so once you get the recipes, of course you'll make your batter, make your three cakes, and then now uh, we're gonna decorate. So when you make your pastry cream, um, you're gonna have to make that in advance because it has to be refrigerated for at least two hours, um, preferably overnight, according to the recipe. And every time I do this, it's messy. Um, now Jackie, uh, like I was kind of saying earlier, is, uh, you know, she probably wasn't making Boston cream pies, uh, but um, she did like to sneak brownies out of the White House kitchen. And occasionally they would uh, find her sneaking ice cream as well in the middle of the night, which I can totally relate to. <laughs> um, her clothing was also extremely tailored. Um, she chose everything just down to the detail, um, what shoes she was gonna wear. Um, they also say uh, one of her uh, assistants actually uh, wrote a book not long ago uh, that exposed, if you will, that Jackie, one of her legs was a little shorter than the other, but like a grain of rice is what they said. So you would have never known, but it was so detailed that she actually had heels that were just, one was just enough to make up for uh, that one slight abnorm abnormality that no one would ever know. <laughs> so I think that's, that's great. Okay, so we put our pastry cream on again. Mine is not gonna be beautiful, but, um, And then you're going to pour your melted chocolate on. Who cannot love some melted chocolate? Um, and another joke about Jackie and food and whatnot is not only the Sam Adams one, but you know, uh, they say, a little known fact was that JFK invented both Boston baked beans and Boston cream pie, but it was Jackie who decided that they should be separate. <laughs> so, again, not pretty, but I think it's going to taste amazing. Okay, so we have our extremely messy and probably not Jackie Chef approved Boston cream pie. Um, all right, so our next one that we're gonna make is Jackie's green risotto. So I've pre-made again our rice because we won't have 30 minutes to stand at the stove. Uh, but you heat olive oil in a pan, you put in some onion, all diced up, um, then you put in your risotto rice, and then slowly add in some beef stock and give it a splash of white wine. 
So instead of like regular rice, the only difference is, is you're cooking this with beef stock um, and letting that kind of boil off. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is use our food processor and chop up our spinach, which just to make it a puree. Now, Jackie uh, took cheese away from this dish, which risotto's typically a cheese-based dish, but this was literally a green risotto. So, I want to give a shout out to my daughter who uh, put my spinach bowl together for me. Kind of got it ready. She's awesome. She's thinking about taking a culinary class. So. Hopefully she'll be able to help me. <laughs> anyway, so you puree your spinach. Stir that up and you have a beautiful, oh my gosh, I'm making a mess. Uh, yeah, for the non-chefs like me, what does puree mean? Uh, puree, uh, make it into a paste. Oh, okay, thank you make it into a paste and then mix it in with your rice and don't make a giant mess like me. Okay, so you'll have your green risotto, which my spinach made a mess, but um, it's, it's delicious either way. And it's a great way to cook risotto in the beef stock. Um, also, um, next we have Jackie Kennedy's baked potato, um, which is super simple. You bake your potato on 350 for about an hour, uh, or more, depending on the size. Um, and then, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to Jackie O this baked potato. Uh, she liked to top her baked potato with sour cream and to make it fancy as Jackie was, uh, you're going to, uh, put caviar right here. Now this is just white caviar. You can get this at Whole Foods, uh, but Jackie liked beluga caviar and that's actually about ten thousand dollars a kilogram and she supposedly had hers served with a mother of pearl spoon so uh this is as close as we can get but it's delicious nonetheless um i also forgot because with a risotto it usually has cheese um, so I'm going to shred a little Parmesan on top um, and getting a block of Parmesan cheese is exponentially more delicious than the stuff that you buy. Uh, and that is coming from uh, a friend of ours who is Italian. So if you don't want to exclude the cheese like Jackie did. Just add a little bit of your shredded Parmesan. Um, okay, so the last thing that we're going to make is our crudite platter, which, you know, charcuterie boards are awesome and everybody loves them. And so uh, that was one of the things that she enjoyed as well to serve. So on here we have uh, Persian cucumber, baguette, snap peas, rainbow carrots, and 
some heirloom tomatoes. But um, you'll get the recipes, of course. But uh, this is tart cherry butter, which is actually really easy to make. Um, and you'll get the recipe, but it's basically just butter and dried tart cherries, as well as honey, kind of all mixed together. I also add some hummus to mine. But one thing that we're gonna put together uh, now is our feta. So it is, excuse me, gotta get my recipe. Uh, we're gonna take seven ounces of feta, add in a little bit, of time. Uh, uh, garlic, two cloves, and some peppercorns. Uh, we're also going to pop in some sun dried tomatoes. And then I've got my funnel here because you're going to put your oil in and that will give you your marinated feta. And it's delicious. And it's a beautiful addition to your charcuterie board or in the more French uh, way of Jackie, a crudité platter. And so you have a beautiful crudite plate. Um, okay, so I do uh, have kind of one more little story um, and it doesn't necessarily totally have to do with Jackie, um, but it has to do with this photo. Uh, so uh, here we have, and I know it's probably hard to see, but this is, Robert Kennedy and the beautiful lady there with the scarf is my mama. Uh, she had the honor of writing with uh, Robert back in the day when he was campaigning, uh, when he came to our small town. So I love to share that. She's also the one that gave me the Kennedy swag there, which again is not JFK campaign related, but Robert Kennedy. Uh, That's cool. So, a couple of people asked about that, about the bumper stickers that were on your refrigerator. <laughs> they <laughs> so are Robert Kennedy, that. and uh, they belong to her, and she passed them along to me recently, and this is her again. Wow. Right well, that's in the car. Cool. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, um, so I just thank you all for watching or tuning in. I hope you didn't think it was crazy. Uh, last time I did- Oh Jackie, yeah, no, you can't see the comments, but the people raving about how much fun <laughs> this was and they learned a lot and it's such, oh, the <laughs> so the, the a couple questions came up that are the same for your other programs. How did you get started doing this? I know you've told us the story before, but for those who didn't see your first two programs, it's a really fascinating story. Oh gosh, is it? I'm not sure. Um, I found the first, I wish I had brought it out. I normally have it and it's not, but um, I found the first lady's cookbook at Goodwill um, and I thought this is cool and I bought it and it was sitting on our bookshelf and my husband saw it one day and told me I should do like a Julia, you know, Julie situation and cook my way through, you know, <laughs> and I did. And I put it on Instagram and COVID and the National First Ladies Library picked me up and now DC Cultures scooped me up and here we are next stop pbs <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, another question that always pops up what happens to all this food that you cook <laughs> oh this is such a great question your, so, your family's your family's waiting off in the wings for some delicious treats <laughs> they 100 percent are um yes my husband's working and so he's waiting He's been wanting to eat the risotto since yesterday. 
Um, my daughter is upstairs. She's waiting to eat. So we eat and uh, especially with desserts, uh, I take that to work work and also to the neighbors. So it gets eaten, which is great. And then another um, question, how many of these first ladies like cooking type programs are either were broadcast or you've researched it and done the um, dishes for them? Like how many would you say you've, you've put together so far? I know you've done quite a few because you've talked about Martha Washington and of course Grace Coolidge and Rosalind Carter and many others. How, well, many, think uh, you, how many think you're uh, up to so far? On, well, on my original Instagram pr project, I have cooked my way through all of them. Wow. Um, so I've cooked a dish for every single first lady. Um, I actually just recently cooked for Jill Biden. I have not posted it or uh, talked about it or whatnot yet, but I've cooked my way through all of them. Um, for the National First Ladies Library, I have done uh, several pre-recorded uh, videos for various first ladies for um, different holidays, food holidays, things like that. Uh, but uh, live programs, I've done uh, Grace Coolidge, uh, Rosalind Carter, as you mentioned, both of those, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Jackie, uh, and most recently, a couple weeks ago, Ida McKinley, uh, and I have Betty Ford coming out. Okay. It's interesting so you mentioned, lot. it's interesting you mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt, because I think there was like three people that asked specifically if you did an Eleanor Roosevelt program I like did. this. So <laughs> we'll have to have you come back um, for that, because she was the one that came out as the um, request. And then there were a few technical questions um, related to cooking stuff. Someone asked, why is it called Boston cream pie if it's not a pie? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. And I, I would know it if somebody didn't ask it. And I don't remember. I'm so yeah. sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Maybe somebody uh, in our but audience knows. This, this particular recipe is from the Omni Parker Hotel in Boston, where the entire thing originated. So, mm -hmm. ah, I don't remember. Oh, no, that's okay. Maybe somebody in our audience um, knows. I've read yeah. that John F. Kennedy was really kind of a simpleton when it came to food. Like, he was into hamburgers and, you know, not there's anything wrong with that. Um, and Jackie was really kind of turned him on to these different types of uh, fine dining type experiences more so than uh, he had. Even, even though he came from a very wealthy family, he had kind of simple common um, food tastes and things like that. Yeah, and, they were kind of opposite on that because she necessarily wasn't growing up, you know, wealthy. So, uh. let's see, there was a few other technical questions. Let me see if I can go back and find what these were. Um, oh, here, here's one. Does Sarah use authentic Italian rice like Carnaroli, is that how you pronounce it? Or Arboroi for the risotto <laughs> the 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 um yes i yep and i'll show you i use but wow okay <laughs> yes which i guess is classic but the thing is is that a lot of times when you go to the store to buy rice to make risotto it's already got stuff mixed in with it like it's cheesy risotto or something like uh -huh. that you you have to if you're going to make jackie's you it has to be plain oh, okay risotto. Mm -hmm. and then here here's another very technical question but an interesting one um someone asked earlier are these the types of things that would have gotten served at the white house for guests or were the, were, did they serve other things for that? I'm guessing they serve fancier type stuff for the guests at the White House and not necessarily Boston cream pie and things, but any yeah. info on that? No, these are just fun Jackie recipes, honestly. Um, she probably did serve things like a crudite platter. She definitely did. Uh, baked potato with the sour cream and caviar was more of her. 
Uh, one of her kind of diets, uh, like she sometimes would only eat one meal a day. Uh, sometimes she'd just eat fruit all day. Mm -hmm. um, so the baked potato was more something just Jackie would have eaten. She probably never served that to people, uh, as well as the green risotto, which was a recipe of a White House chef, uh, probably just for her kind of thing. Um, and Boston cream pie, again, is just really a Kennedy thing. So uh, the Kennedys uh, for their uh, state dinners, especially, were very French, um, of course, and very elaborate, um, but not as elaborate as some first ladies. Um, but uh, stuff like beef stroganoff, and, and different things like that or more on the menu for state dinners. Okay, no problem. Nancy gave us the hookup. She said the dessert acquired its name when cakes and pies were cooked in the same pans and the words were used interchangeably, according to Wikipedia. So that's cool. Um, this was a question from a long time ago. So I don't know if you already asked, answered this or if this makes sense. Someone just wrote um, cooked or raw spinach question mark. Is that need anything? This was raw spinach that I use to mix into my already hot cooked rice. Okay. But the recipe does say that you can steam the spinach and then chop it up, puree it in your food processor. So you can do it either way. Right. Okay. What about, um, this is another question that people have asked in the other programs um, and you've always been gracious about answering who's your favorite first lady <laughs> grace coolidge oh really okay and why is yes. that um i think she was well then i love the 1920s uh and i love kind of the time in which she lived but uh she was just so cool i mean she had a pet raccoon Name Rebecca. I mean, come on, who can be cooler? Uh, but before I, I did anything related to this and cooked my way through and learned anything about first ladies that I'd never known that much about, I wouldn't have said that. I probably would have went more towards an Eleanor or a Jackie, which they're amazing too, and I love them as well. But no, Grace Coolidge. She's cool. Yeah, Grace Coolidge is a really great first lady. If you um, didn't see Sarah's program that she did on her, you should really check it out. It was a lot of fun. And Grace Coolidge, really amazing first lady, um, set a lot of precedents, had a really interesting life. Um, and of course, the food and the drinks that Sarah talked about were really amazing as well. Um, and then here's another question you frequently get. What's been your own personal favorite dish? Not necessarily for Jacqueline Kenny, but just all the first ladies. And then what about your families? <laughs> Ah, I thought you were going to say maybe the worst one, because that's more of a fun story. Well, but... you can answer that one, too. <laughs> okay, I'll answer that one, too, because I think that one's more fun. The, the, the favorite, I think, of my family is, is the beef stroganoff, Jackie mm. Kennedy. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. It's always been one that everybody liked. It's popular. One of the weirder ones that we all liked as well was a vegetable chartreuse, which was kind of like a vegetable jello moldy type thing. Can't remember who we cooked that for. It was an older one, maybe Jefferson or Madison, but it was good. It looked like it was going to be gross. It was good. <laughs> um, my daughter, who's almost she'll be 14 next month but you know uh she's tried every single thing i've ever made including the thing that's my favorite story about the worst uh and she even liked a vegetable chartreuse but the worst is martha washington uh and uh that was the beef steak and kidney pie that i will never forget <laughs> that was the first thing let's do this let's do this project and I'm like all right and I you know 
drive out to a local meat place to get these beef kidneys, which I'm like, no. And, you know, we get them and the guy's like, "Uh uh-uh, good luck, basically. And uh, I thought, this is going to be terrible, you know, this whole project. But that was the worst one. So beef, steak, and kidney pie. Martha Washington. What was so bad about the taste? Uh, It'll just imagine it in your mind. (laughs) Kidneys, you know, this in livers. It's, it's, no. It was, and I'm talking followed recipe, you know. Again, not a chef. So I'm sure there's people out there that could probably cook kidney and it tastes delicious but I don't have those skills and I follow the drug and it, no, it was awful. <laughs> so if anybody wants to, they can go to my Instagram, scroll all the way back through and, uh, and, and see my original reaction to <laughs> eating that for the first time, which was terrible. <laughs> well, our friend June chimed in in the comments and she said, my mother-in-law made steak and kidney pie and I never ate it. It smelled awful. So I think she can um, relate to you. Well, that, so the very first thing you made was not good, but you stuck with it. That's <laughs> very good. So I think some people would have got, dis- I think some people would have got discouraged and just given up after the one, but then it's been all uphill ever since, huh? Uh, well, yeah, so far. <laughs> yeah. And then here's another question that, um, you've answered before, but people keep asking it. So what first ladies were the best cooks? Is there any ones that kind of stand out as, oh, they were really good at their cooking skills? People, uh, always, people always want to know that. Yes. And I always hate to answer it because I always don't, I can't think off the fly on it because I'm so focused on this particular first lady. But um, oh. I, I think I always want to say, I want to say it's Lucretia Garfield. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be almost, and she wasn't the best cook or anything, but she said the one thing that I love about cooking. And I'm pretty sure it's her, but like she had to make bread every day and she didn't like it, but she was like, dang it. If I've got to make bread every day, I'm going to make it the best bread anybody's ever had mm-hmm. sort of thing. So I like that about her. Um, you always think about Eleanor Roosevelt in the kitchen, but hers was the absolute worst White House kitchen. <laughs> Everybody hated her food for <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, Betty Ford was a decent cook, but also very simple. Um, isn't it kind of challenging because a couple people brought up good points you know when they're in the white house they're not actually slaving away in the kitchen um no. putting dishes together yeah. there's cooks and chefs and stuff and um that they're working with and things like that so yeah i think it's more about like their level of uh involvement maybe yeah involved yeah that's <laughs> involvement in exactly you know what they're doing in the kitchen you know even whether they're just saying what served, how it served. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ida McKinley, for instance, uh, was not, she didn't really care really what was served, uh, but she was very in floral arrangements that were being mm-hmm. put out. So, you know, uh, gosh, that's so hard. Oh, no, it's that's okay. So, what so about, sorry. can you, oh, no, no, it's okay. Um, can you tell us about your other, the, your, um, projects with the First Ladies Library and the other programs you have coming. I looked at their calendar and they're not on the calendar just yet, but maybe you can just tell people what's going to be. I'll be, oh, yeah. I'll be happy Probably to send out the yet. information to people when they're on the calendar. Um, well, uh, Betty Ford for sure is coming up. Uh, that'll yeah, be said on the... April 25th. Yes. And then uh, Nancy Reagan in June. I believe June 25th. Mm -hmm. Um, Other than that, um, I hope to do more content for my Instagram as well as pre-recorded content for them as well. It's just about the time and uh, research ability to put that together. But those are for sure on the Mm -hmm. books. Um, And they probably, yeah, 
have not put them out yet. It's yeah, so Sarah does programs for the National First Ladies Library in is it Canton, Ohio? Yes, they're in Canton, they're, Ohio. They're and um, she's going to do two programs with them. They're just not on their calendar just yet. So she's scheduling, but they haven't put out. When they get on her calendar, be happy to send that information out so you can learn more about those two First Ladies as well. And if you follow my Instagram, I always post about when I'm doing things. So you can find it there too. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. This has been really fascinating. Um, yeah, this people were raving about this was really fun and they learned a lot and they didn't know all this stuff about Jacqueline Kennedy. So bravo and, and kudos to you. That was fabulous. Um, let's see if anybody else has any last minute questions. What here's I don't know if you can answer this question. Someone asked, what kind of sweets did John F. Kennedy like? I don't I know a lot about John F. Kennedy. I don't actually know that myself. Oh. I don't know about JFK. Besides Boston, besides Boston cream pie. <laughs> um, I, I don't know about JFK. Yeah, I'm not sure of that myself. Jackie was into strawberries, Romanoff. Uh, she would occasionally get up in the night and sneak ice cream uh, and also swipe the brownies from the White House kitchen. So, <laughs> but JFK, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm more of a first ladies person oh yeah no that's okay so hold, hold on let me um pull up your info again just one second so here's a couple of pictures of sarah from program fast um let's see what can you tell us real it's uh not related to jacqueline kenny can, can you tell us about this fabulous looking dish here Okay, I'm sorry, I'm stepping away because I can't see my computers. Oh, it's away. okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, the, the, I think yes. it was the Grace Coolidge uh, pineapple. Yes, that is Grace Coolidge. And that's a pineapple salad, uh, which I always say sounds really boring, but that's one from the First Lady's cookbook, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a boat of whipped cream and cherries, and it's beautiful. Um, and yes, that's a Grace Coolidge dish. Super easy, really cool to present. Sort of like a crudite platter. Very fancy <laughs> to present, but extremely easy to put together. Okay, no problem. And then here's Sarah's Instagram page, Cooking with the First Ladies. And I posted the link a few times in the chat in Zoom, so. Okay, well, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy uh, day to show us all these different culinary uh, projects and pre really appreciate you sharing all the information about Jacqueline Kennedy. I, I, just, I feel like she gets so typecast as the first lady who you know, just was really classy and wore nice clothes and people don't realize all the things that she um, accomplished and was involved in during her career. So really appreciate you taking um, time I out to I could have went on that. forever, but you know. Oh, no, that's okay. No, 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 not a problem. And then as I mentioned before, you can find um, the two previous programs that uh, Sarah did with us, Grace Coolidge and Rosalind Carter, and there'll be more coming up in the future. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. And a special thanks to Sarah for taking time out to spend some time with us. And we'll see you all next time. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rob.